Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Victor from the Star Events team, and I'm glad to be your host for the session this morning. Thank you for joining this morning's Life on Web online seminar on primary immune deficiency, a hidden health threat. This one hour session is jointly organized by the STAR, Malaysia Patient Organization for Primary Immune Deficiencies, or my POPI, and the Pediatric Immunology Unit, Faculty of Medicine, UKM. A big thanks to our sponsors, International Patient Organization for Primary Immune Deficiencies, IPOPI, Malaysian Society of Allergy and Immunology, MySci, and MyPoppy for supporting and making this webinar possible. It is streamed live on Starbiz Facebook page, so thank you to everyone who's tuning in right now. Do share our Starbiz Facebook Live with any of your friends or colleagues or who are actually keen to join. We've actually placed the link onto the um, chat session at the bottom of the page. All right, a few quick housekeeping matters before we begin. As everyone dials into this webinar through different internet bandwidth and devices, you may or may not experience minor technical glitches. So please be patient if there's any. To minimize the risk of technical glitch, all participants are muted and video cam turned off by default. But do participate by posting questions up to our panel. You may send in your questions to our panelists at any time during this session. On your user panel, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions there if you're using Zoom. As we're actually quite pressed for time, please do leave your questions there, but do not leave them anonymously as the panelists will try and answer your questions directly via email after the webinar if they are actually not answered live. For those who are actually joining on Facebook, you may place your questions on the comment section. However, if you do wish the panelists to answer directly uh, after the event, please do register and join us on Zoom. The bit.ly link is bit.ly slash immune deficiency. There will actually be a short survey at the end. So to those joining us on Zoom, please take a few minutes to complete it as your opinion really matters to us. Lastly, and most importantly, please engage, learn, and enjoy. People with primary immune deficiencies, or PI in short, are more likely to suffer from health issues or frequent and reoccurring infections. Early diagnosis and treatment of PI can prevent mortality and improve the quality of life. Today, we learned about the treatment, symptoms, characteristics of PI, so do stay tuned. We hope that at the end of the session, you as patients or caregivers will be able to get a better understanding and at the same time have a sense of empowerment and purpose when tackling and managing this illness. For this morning's discussion, we have the pleasure of having two renowned and respected experts in their respective fields as our panelists. We have Dr. Adli Ali. He is a senior clinical lecturer and consultant pediatric immunologist in UKM Specialist Children's Hospital and Hospital Chancellor Swanku Mukris, UKM, Malaysia. He is heading the clinical immunology services in the newly established UKM Specialist Children's Hospital and his clinical work focuses on care for patients with primary and secondary immunity and regulatory uh, disorders, autoimmune allergy diseases and vaccinology. Besides being actively involved with academic teaching and clinical work in patient care and research, he is a prominent driving force in primary advocacy, both nat uh, nationally and regionally. Dr. Adley was fundamental in the inception of My Poppy, and he is one of the founding members of Southeast Asian Primary Immune Deficiencies Network, or CIPID, a regional network of professionals involved in the care and research of primary, primary immune deficiencies. Our other panelist is Dr. Amir Hamza Abdulatif. Dr. Amir is, um, he actually joined the University Putra Malaysia UPM in 2006 as an associate professor in pediatrics and clinical immunology at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And in 2009, he was appointed the head of department in pediatrics 
And uh, the following year, he joined the Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Sciences of Monash University, Malaysia, Sunway Campus, as the Clinical uh, Associate Professor in Clinical Immunology and Pediatrics. He has been in private practice as the resident consultant clinical immunologist, allergist, and pediatrician since 2011 at the Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. In uh, 2017, he pioneered, he pioneered the first allergy and immunology center in the private health center of Malaysia in uh, PHKL. He was uh, recently uh, appointed as adjunct um, clinical professor, Department of Pediatrics, Hospital, Hospital Pangaja UPM in 2021. As a moderator, we have Karen Koh. Karen Koh co-founded the My Poppy together with a few families affected by primary immune deficiencies in 2014. She's the mother of a primary immune deficiency patient herself, which actually compelled herself to co-found My Poppy in the effort to raise greater awareness for primary immune deficiency diseases in Malaysia. She currently serves as the secretary of My Poppy. I will now hand over the stage to Ms. Karen Cole. Over to you, Karen. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Thank you for Thank you. the kind introduction. A very good morning and I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Uh, my name is Karen, as Victor has introduced earlier, and I will be a moderator for this webinar. Well, welcome and thank you for joining us today um, for this webinar entitled Primary Immunodeficiency, a Hidden Health Threat. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin this webinar by sharing my personal experience with Primary Immunodeficiency, or PI for short. I am a mother of a 17-year-old son who was diagnosed with X-linked agama globulinemia, or XLA, a type of PID when he was five years old. When the doctor told me about my son's diagnosis, I was at a loss as I had never heard about PI ever. And many PID patients in their families you know, will share the same experience when they first learned about PI. We all know about cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes, but not many are aware about PI. PI, if left untreated, can be life-threatening, and yet the awareness of this condition remains very low even today. It's time to put the spotlight on primary immunodeficiencies. Well, we are very, very pleased to have with us today Dr. Amir and Dr. Adli, who will give us a better understanding on PI and its awareness. As the saying goes, early detection could save lives. Good morning, Dr. Amir. Good morning, Dr. Adli. Thank you for joining this discussion which centers on PI and the hidden health threats. For my first question, if I may direct it to Dr. Adli, what is the PID? Over to you, Dr. Adli. Okay, um, thank you so much, Karen. So before we dive into primary immunodeficiencies, it will, good, it will be good for us to understand briefly on our immune system, which I think um, we mainly take it for granted. So our immune system is composed of various different types of white blood cells. So there are cells are made in the bone marrow and travel through the bloodstream to different parts of the body. These protect and defend against attack by the foreign invaders such as the germs, the bacteria and fungi. And antibodies, which I think most people have heard by now uh, because of the COVID pandemic, are proteins that are made by our immune system in response to infection or immunization, such as the vaccination um, for COVID, and help to fight infection. So in general, we have multiple defense mechanisms in the shape of different white cell counts, the B cells, the T cells, the NK cells, antibodies, and many more. So when part of this immune system is either absent or not functioning properly, it can result in a defect and dysfunction in our immune system. So this is what we know as, or we refer to as um, immune deficiency disease. And when the cause of this deficiency is hereditary or due to genetic defect, then we will call this as primary immunodeficiency disease, uh, disease, or what we call as PID, the discussion of um, today. So interestingly, Karen, um, PID, if I may say and claim it, um, it is 
only one or a few of the health problems that are still expanding today and we are still discovering. To date, there are more than 400 different types of known PID disorder and we have many more patients with PID that we are yet to fully understood and to crack the code, so the list will definitely growing. In short, Karen, the primary immunodeficiency, although it is an old entity, we have known about it for nearly more than 17 years now, the health community is only yet to be aware and get to know about it. Yeah, Dr. Adli, you mentioned earlier that PIDs are, a, are still a growing group, you know, more than 400 types of disorders. That is a lot. Can you share, you know, what are some of the more common disorders? Okay, um, yes, uh, definitely. So I will start with the most severe form of PID known as the Severe Combined Immunodeficiency, also known as KIT, or possibly most of the um, people may refer it as a bubble boy disease. So as the, name, um, as the name have suggested, patients who are inflicted by this disease have a defect in the genetic information that form the immune system. Okay. This resulted with the baby or the child with skid to literally have no or a very low number of these immune cells. And because of this, the baby are very prone to any kind of infections. Mm -hmm. So although they are born looking mostly normal with good weight and appears healthy, their immune system is not normal, they are dysfunction. So by the first few months of life, this baby, if not treated, will have severe infection. They are not able to fit well, eventually without proper diagnosis and treatment, will die within the first year of life. Another example of PID disease, something that is very near to Karen herself, is Xlin A gamma globinemia, um, or XLA. So the patient with XLA have an absence of genetic information that provide the crucial component that allow the immune cells to produce antibodies. So because of this defect, the affected individual with XLA will not be able to produce their own antibodies. They are responsible to protect the bodies against bacteria and viral infection. So as this genetic information is stored on the specific area on the X chromosome, hence the name, the patients are mostly affecting boys, although the girls are the carrier for the disease. They usually present with multiple respiratory infections by the first and second year of life and require antibiotic treatment. So without proper diagnosis and treatment with regular antibodies replacement therapy, the patient with SLA may end up with multiple health problems and won't be able to survive beyond childhood. So another disease that affecting Malaysia significantly is um, chronic rheumatoid disease or CGD. CGD is an inherited disease that occurs in a type of white blood cell known as phagocytes uh, that usually help to um, the body to fight infections. And if this doesn't work properly, um, it will lead to um, bacterial and fungal infection um, that can be life-threatening and involve a lot of a system, the skin, the gut, the lungs, and the other organs. And without proper treatment, patients will not survive to adulthood. So there are many, many more of this example, and this is just a few, Karen, and I'd like to emphasize this. If you ask me this question just 10 years ago, at that time, we only know at around, of around maybe 200 diseases of PID. And now we are looking at 450 new diseases. Yeah? And the list is growing each year. So again, there are a lot more that we need to learn and discover about primary immunodeficiency. Thank you, Dr. Adli. Well, that is really you know, insightful and alarming at the same time, I must say. So let's now talk about the prevalence of uh, PID. Dr. Ami, if I may ask you, what is the prevalence of PID globally? Are these conditions prevalent, prevalent in Malaysia itself? Yes, uh, very good morning, uh, Karen, Adli, and everybody. Uh, Assalamualaikum. I hope everybody is keeping nice and safe, all right? Um, thanks for this uh, platform. And um, I'm just going to call uh, primary immunodeficiency as PI because PID might be a pelvic infirmary. Three is uh, disease <laughs> okay. or prolapse, uh, intervertebral disease. You know, I think uh, let's just keep it to the PI. And um, so, if uh, we talk about PI, it is actually not rare. Now, this is a misconception that people had from a, quite a, many years now. And I like to keep uh, it nice and simple. Let's have the record straight. It is not rare. And taken collectively, now, Adli mentioned that uh, more uh, 450 different types of disorders, right? And if you put it together, then collectively, the prevalence is thought to be about 1 in 1,200. So what that means is, for every 1,200 people that you meet, 
there will be one person with PI, right? So this is not considered rare. A disease is rare if it is one in 2,000. That means for every 2,000 people, there will be one person with that rare disease. So this could be many others and we are focused on PI. Now, um, I have an infographic here, and um, let's see. Um, if we take our uh, own uh, population, right, and uh, say we are now about, what, 33 million population, and if you look at it, if with the prevalence of 1,200, 1 in 1,200, then just take 30 million, just round it off. You know, we uh, Saturday morning, we don't want to think and calculate too uh, much, okay? <laughs> All right. So we would expect 25,000 patients with PI in Malaysia, 25,000. So, but if you're looking at the infographic here, what's happening, unfortunately, till this point of time, the number of PI patients diagnosed is less than 2%, less than 2%. So we are only getting less than 500 patients diagnosed when we should have diagnosed at least 25,000, if not more now, because if 33 million, well, that'd be another 3 million people. So there'd be another 2,500, 27,500 should be here. And diagnosed and yet it's less than 500. So we need to make great efforts to diagnose those yet to be considered likely to have PI quickly, as this will put their lives at greater risk of morbidity and even death. All right. Thank you, Dr. Amir. So, you know, coming back to the prevalence, I think it all boils down to awareness. And yeah. uh, I think this is the most important question, you know, that I think um, all our viewers have in mind today. What are the symptoms of PI that the public should be made aware of? Okay, so if we look at the uh, next uh, infographic, right, the, the so-called uh, 10 warning signs, right? So this is uh, something that has been um, put up by my Popi, and it's modeled after the uh, one that was uh, initially uh, started by Jeffrey Model Foundation, right? So, but it's a pretty busy slide, okay? 10 warning signs, essentially mainly more for children there'll be a slightly different uh, set for adults. But the key thing, right, the key thing that symptoms of primary immunodeficiencies or PI are mainly associated uh, with infections, as you can see from here, particularly those affecting the respiratory system, including the ear, the nose, the throat, and the lungs, right? For example, uh, if you have cough, fever, running nose, right? And then your child is not very active, or you yourself as an adult uh, feeling all fatigued. And then uh, we start thinking, how do we now kind of uh, suspect? Now think of the acronym SPUR, S-P-U-R, SPUR. Now that will spur you to think about whether you have PI or not. So what does that mean? So spur S, right? So S is serious uh, infection. For example, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bones. Now that's a serious infection. If you have that, hey, have I got PI? Has my child got PI, right? And then U is for unusual, okay? Unusual uh, organisms, microbes, because most of us will be exposed to the normal bacteria. Now we know from our national immunization program uh, for the first two years, I'm sure all the audience will probably know about uh, streptococcus, haemophilus. Uh, so these are the more common ones. But, and so even if you have a normal immune system, you can still get the infection. But if you get an infection from a, a very unusual uh, organism, say Pseudomonas aeruginosa, wow, you know, Sounds very fanciful. So I suppose the more fanciful it sounds, like another example, chromobacterium violation. So <laughs> then you start thinking, hey, that's a very unusual name. Have I got PI? Right? And then we talk about um, a P. I should have gone to P first. You know, I just too excited here. I've gone all over the place. <laughs> but persistent. Now, persistent is very simple, right? You get an infection um, and you go to see the doctor. Uh, doctor thinks, yeah, it's serious enough. You've got to take some oral antibiotics. You've done that once. 
still no uh, change in your infection or it's gotten even worse. Now you get admitted and you get intravenous, right? So you get antibiotics through the drip. Now you think, oh dear, now do I have PI? So we got S, P, U, and R. R is recurrent. So you have uh, recurrent infections, too many infections at any one time. And of course, uh, as you grow older, the num if you have even, let's say, two uh, pneumonia in 12 months, you would think, hey, have I got PI? So those are the, the uh, sort of symptoms and from the 10 warning signs. But another important aspect of the warning signs for PI is the family history of PI. And in fact, this together with um, infection that requires uh, intravenous antibiotics to clear up would be very uh, one of the more telling uh, warning signs. So that's the uh, 10 warning signs. Right. Thank you, Dr. Amir. Um, to all our viewers, you know, um, this 10 warning sign poster, you know, um, can be downloaded from my Poppy Facebook or website, you know, should you want to have uh, to take a look at the poster, um, uh, you know, clearly, right? So, Dr. Amir, um, back to you again. Do you have many patients in the private hospitals who came to you with early onset in the form of allergies that led to a diagnosis of a certain PI eventually? Yeah, I mean, um, if, you, if you think about it, yes, I do see patients, right? And then we, they have recurrent nasal symptoms, right? So they are having blocked nose, runny nose, and it was taught by patients or referred by doctors to be uh, allergic rhinitis, right? Or maybe say chronic eczema. So you got the skin disease, eczema. Everybody knows about eczema. I would have thought so. And But if you take a good clinical story in the background, then you start thinking, now there's recurrent infection. You know, there's spur. Think about that spur. Keep on thinking about it. Everybody, not just the healthcare professional, family members the public just keep on thinking and uh if uh, and, and that's what i always say if you want to diagnose pi okay to diagnose pi is to think pi if you don't think about pi you're not going to diagnose pi so one always must have a high index of suspicion for pi hence i, I do see these patients and obviously as a clinical knowledgeist i must not miss these patients right and here remember you're looking for those uh 98 of the other PI here in Malaysia that's yet to be diagnosed. Hence, um, once I know and I suspect, yes, it could be PI, I would then proceed to do further relevant tests to assess the immune system. And at times this can lead to genetic studies as well, particularly when there's a family history of PI. So yes, I do see uh, those patients coming with a benign allergy, eczema, and end up with a PI. Mm. Wow, thank you, Dr. Amir. Back to you, Dr. Adli. So the symptoms shared by Dr. Ane earlier are very similar to some of the common infections you know, that children may have growing up. Do physicians tend to miss these symptoms and treat the infection without addressing the underlying cause of PI? Yes, I guess the answer, the direct answer to that, Karen, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. That's in children especially, even in adults, because the symptoms may appear to be just an infection. Mm -hmm. It is usually go unnoticed, ignored, misdiagnosed, and subsequently mistreated. So that is very, very unfortunate. Um, as what Dr. Ami had mentioned, to diagnose PI is to think PI. And I think Delay in diagnosis among patients with PI or primary immunodeficiency is very common. And in some, unfortunately, it took the death of one to a few of their family members before the diagnosis of PID was unraveled and known to them. So the reason is mainly, again, awareness. And most of the patient was born relatively normal. So most of the cases, the child appears to be normal. A lot of parents, families, or even doctors think it may just be a normal infection or illness. Mm. So again, as what Dr. Ami had mentioned, I will want to emphasize this again and again to guide the clinicians, to guide the families, the, the friends, you know, your, your, your friends and things like that. There are now a simple guideline that the expert had come out. Um, it comes in two approaches. Both had been mentioned by Dr. Ami. I know people were asking, it was very small. Um, I believe that we already now provide the link for you all to, to download it. Um, you can basically get it in a, from our website. It comes in two flavors. The 10 warning sign had explained by Dr. Ami and the spur. Again, it stands for serious, persistent infection, unusual infection, 
and recurrent infection. So this is spur. I think we have a nice infographic. Yes, about this. You can take a look at it. You know, spur, spur the thoughts of PID is supposed to think you have to have that thinking. If you are looking at any infection, if it's serious, if it's persistent, if it's unusual, if it's recurrent, spur the thought of this. Can this be a primary immunodeficiency? So this is what being shown on the on the slide now. So we have shown worldwide and in Malaysia too that most of these PID patients or primary immunodeficiency patients were generally misdiagnosed or in the case where the diagnosis was eventually made, there was a significant delay in the diagnosis, yeah, up to even 20 years in some cases or even longer. So an awareness and the spur of the thought of possible diagnosis of PID of primary immunodeficiency in patients with severe persistent, unusual, and recurrent infection, and other related symptoms of PID. I know someone actually mentioned about psoriasis, okay? Um, you know, uh, someone asking about skin lesion. If it's severe, if it's unusual, if it's something, and then there are more than that with infection in multiple, it is worth for us to think about PID, and I think we want to emphasize this. So we don't misdiagnose, we don't mistreat, and we do not let for the patient not to have a proper diagnosis. Yep, and I think uh, that is what we want to emphasize, Karen. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adili. I think that's so important. So Dr. Amir, I mean, Dr. Adili touched, you know, on the common infections amongst children. You know, some of our My Poppy members, you know, were diagnosed as an adult. Does this mean the diagnosis was actually missed during childhood? Or these defects can manifest themselves at any age, even during adulthood? Dr. Amir? Yes, um, I think um, this is a very important aspect, right? Uh, and we have to be aware. Uh, for a longest period of time, I think when you talk about PI and people think it's congenital, and the, the minute they put the word congenital, they oh, it's got to be diagnosed during childhood, right? Uh, as a baby, newborn, and you start thinking, oh, my child is not growing well, I've got a recurrent infection. Okay, so good. We have, we have been spurred now to think, uh, yes, in children. But hey, this PI can also be manifesting during adulthood. So uh, to answer your question, yes, sure. The, the PID uh, in adults, they could have been missed during childhood, right? And, and that can have serious consequences because if you have missed it during childhood and then it goes on into adulthood, then I think it's almost uh, sinful that we have missed that, right? Uh, and, and this goes across the board, right? Uh, I, I think uh, this is uh, something we keep on emphasizing. And so, yes, it could have been missed during childhood, but it can also uh, happen during adulthood. And uh, we diagnose uh, several patients. And in fact, if we take some uh, conditions like, uh, especially the primary antibody deficiencies, that means you don't have the um, part of your defense systems. And we, I think the word antibody is now uh, always thought about during this COVID, right? Antibody testing, antibody testing. So it's good, right? There's certain things that I think the audience would know about antibody. So imagine that your antibody cannot be formed at any time, right? Most of them would be during childhood. But if you take a, a condition called common variable immunodeficiency, oh, it's a bit of a mouthful, right? CVID. So if you think about CVID, you will see there will be actually two peaks, right? You might totally miss it during childhood, which is the one peak. But there's another second peak around 20 to 30 years old. So, um, and sometimes even older. So yes, they can manifest themselves during uh, adulthood. And so now to spur on, not from childhood, spur, spur on, keep on thinking, adulthood as well, PI. Always think, across all ages, think about PI until proven otherwise. You won't go wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amir. Coming back to you, Dr. Adli, you know, can PI or primary immunodeficiencies be severe and life-threatening? I think that's a very important question. Yes, and I guess that is the most important and why we really want to emphasize on this. Because when you have a defect in your immune system, you can just imagine it's like your, your, your country do not have any defense. And one of the main primary immunodeficiencies that occurs during the first few months of life is called skin. 
We touched this briefly at the beginning of the session and it's worth remembering and repeating because it is important, okay? Severe common immunodeficiency. The word itself have the word severe there, okay? And this, in this disease, the child is born without their T cells or an abnormally function of their T cells. Um, and in most severe type of skin, they don't even have B cells, NK cells, and they will, they will have um, either absent a very low level of the antibodies. So as you can only imagine, this baby who are born with skid literally do not have any defense system on their own. So although the mother provides some protection through their antibodies transmission during pregnancy and breastfeeding, this is why pediatrician highly, highly emphasize on breastfeeding, the importance of breathing, but due to the severe and massive defect in the immune system, this protection is not adequate. So the patient with skid, yeah, uh, with um, severe combined immune deficiency usually are born normal with normal pregnancy, normal, de normal delivery, no complication, most of them, with good weight and no abnormality to detect from outside. So if you ask me, you know, looking at the baby, is this patient have skid? I can't. I can't take a look at it. It's, there's no difference with any babies. But within the next few weeks or months when the baby when will start to be ill, there will be poor feeding, they may have diarrhea, started feeding less and less. In some cases, they may have fever, but in some, they just appear ill. And as baby tend to usually sleep more and not able to communicate, these symptoms, these signs can be subtle and they may go unnoticed, especially with unexperienced or untrained eyes. So when they usually come to the hospital to seek treatment, most of the time the infection is already overwhelming and spread to multiple places. And at that time, it's a bit complicated for us to treat. Of course, we're going to treat. Um, it's still hope mainly, but if we can diagnose them early, this is better. So the only way this can be prevented is to identify and to diagnose this patient with primary immunodeficiency as early as possible so that prompt treatment and advice can be given. Right. So Dr. Adli, you've already touched a bit on you know, early diagnosis, you know, and so how how can you know or how are PI diagnosed? Okay, um, I, that, that is, of course, a very next important question people want to ask. And luckily, most of the severe and the common primary immunodeficient disease can be screened and diagnosed with a simple blood test. There are a few tests that can be done in most centers in Malaysia, which is the full blood count. I think this is available nearly everywhere. Okay? And this is a good screening test. And what we're going to look, we're going to look at the white cell count number and the pattern. And a low number or even a high number in some may suggest something is not right with the immune system. And this will require further investigation or workout. The second widely available test is the antibodies measurement. I think um, in the blood, you know, people are now measuring immunoglobulin even themselves, you know, in the centers because of the COVID. This is one of the tests. But of course, the test that we are doing is actually looking at the whole overview of the antibodies. And in some PIDs, their antibody level can be very low and the function can be abnormal. And I think the third test that we usually do is looking at the white cell count number in more details. This is what we call immunophenotyping of the white cell count subsets. And this will tell us the actual count of each of the immune cells in the body. But to further confirm primary immunodeficiency and evaluating the function of the immune system, we have specialized tests mostly available in Malaysia, and this include genetic testing and functional immunological investigation. But for this test, it can be done to referral to the immunologists, such as Dr. Ame, myself, and some of my colleagues in the um, some of the centers. So, but one very important point, Karen, is the newborn screen, um, newborn screening, if I may, especially for the screening of severe form of primary immunodeficiency, which include the severe combined immunodeficiency. This is available and had been used in numbers of countries, and in the US, this is now part of the routine test performed in every newborn child nationwide in the US. This is a simple test. We're able to screen not just severe common immunodeficiency, but many other types of PID diseases and some other severe childhood disease. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, although the technology and the expertise, Dr. Ame, myself and my group, you know, our group, able to perform this test, the test is yet to be integrated in our national newborn screening programs. So we, the immunologists, the pediatrician, and I believe the parents and many of our patients really hope this newborn screening for primary immunodeficiency will be considered by the government in the near future to make it available for all newborn babies in the country. 
so that early diagnosis and prompt treatment of severe PID can be made. Yes, truly indeed, you know, early detection, you know, could save lives, yeah. So Dr. Adli, we've touched on the warning signs, we've touched on SPUR, we've touched on early diagnosis and screening. And you've, you know, both you and Dr. Amir mentioned that, you know, PI can be severe and life-threatening. So are there actually treatments for PI patients? You know, is there a cure for PI? Yes. Um, thank you, Karen, for that question. And we are very lucky. We are very lucky now um, because before, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when patients have this PI, you know, of course, it was mostly undiagnosed before, but even if it's diagnosed, the available treatment was not great. And the treatment for primary immunodeficiency will involve preventing and treating infection, boosting the immune system, and treating the underlying cause of the immune problems. So there are multiple type of treatment modalities now available. It ranges from the simple usage, but proper usage of anti-effective agents, such as our antibiotics, the antiviral, the antifungal. And this can be either as treatment or as prophylaxis to prevent infection. So infections in primary immunodeficiency, because they have the you know, abnormal immune system, require rapid and aggressive treatment with antibiotics. So treatment usually a longer course of antibiotic than usually prescribed for normal patient. And in the infection does not respond well, the patient may require to be hospitalized for the usage of intravenous antibiotics. One of the specialized and very important treatment that I would like to emphasize for most patients with primary immunodeficiency is the immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Um, some people know it as IVIG, which is intravenous immunoglobulin, or the subcutaneous immunoglobulin therapy. Just um, you know, depend on how we deliver that. So immunoglobulin consists of antibody protein needed for the immune system to fight infection. As okay. these patients do not able to produce their own antibodies, we have to provide that for them. Okay, And it can be either injected into a vein, into the blood vessel through an intravenous line or inserted underneath the skin, what we call a subcutaneous infusion. And the intravenous treatment is needed every few weeks, usually monthly, and the subcutaneous infusion is needed once to um, twice um, a week. And this treatment in most PID patients are usually lifelong, means the patients are dependent on this treatment to survive. This is their lifeline. Without this so-called regular replacement therapy, this monthly treatment or this weekly treatment, they will not ever to survive. So what most important here, the availability, the adequate access to this treatment for each and every one of our PID, primary immunity patient, is very important, very crucial, and need to be well supported by the stakeholders. On the positive note, I think um, you're talking about, you're asking me about cure. And luckily for PID patient with the advancement in technology in the recent years, now we have effective and cure for patient with primary immunodeficiency. And this is offered through the stem cell transplantation. Okay, the stem cell transplantation of a permanent cure for several forms of life-threatening immunodeficiency. And what we do is that we provide the normal stem cells, transfer it to the person with immunodeficiency, so giving him or you know, her the normally functioning immune system. So this stem cell can be harvested by through the bone marrow or through the blood vessels or through the placenta by the cord blood banking. Um, and we are very lucky in Malaysia because now, I think since the last about 10 years, stem cell transplantation for some type of PID are available in some centers in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, only a few, but I think that's, that's a very positive note. So, Although it might not be covering the whole lot of treatment for all the primary immunodeficiency disease yet, this is definitely a positive step towards the right direction. And we really hope in the near future, more effective modalities and treatment for PID, including the gene therapy, you know, the better option of immunoglobulin replacement therapy will be available for our patients, our primary immunodeficiency patient in Malaysia. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adli. You know, that is, you know, hope, you know, for all PI patients in Malaysia. So coming back to you, Dr. Amir, um, you are one of the authors of a white paper entitled Primary Immunodeficiencies, a Hidden Health Threat. Can you share what this white paper is all about in a nutshell or in summary? Over to you, Dr. Amir. Yes, thank, um, thank you very much, uh, Karen. I, and um, this is a very important uh, advocacy white paper, right, on the trials and tribulations of PI patients uh, and their families in um, Malaysia, right? 
and in the trials and tribulations of these patients and their families, these patients not being accorded optimal care, right? As cases are underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and not treated adequately, leading to morbidity and mortality. Hence, it was important that my POP had this paper uh, advocate uh, their causes. So, um, and it was uh, quite a journey. So, if I uh, uh, share some slides, so um, and I and I hope the uh, audience uh, would appreciate um, the uh, the concerns, right, of the group of patients with PI. So um, those slides um, will show you the uh, roadmap that uh, we had, and um, uh, since um, 2017, right? Since 2017, the um, the committee from Masai the Malaysian Society of Allergy and Immunology. So if we have the slides up now, I think uh, that would be uh, good. And, um, and we, together with my Popi, Masai, because I was the uh, president then, uh, I've, uh, um, I've uh, now the immediate past president. So it has been um, a, a pet project in a way um, and to help the patients, right, with PI. So, and together, uh, Masai and my Popi, we coin ourselves, Pintar Mas. Okay, Pintar. Now, what does Pintar mean? Okay, okay, Pintar means smart, lah, of course. And we like to think that we, <laughs> we have to be smart about things. We have to alert the stakeholders, the policy makers in particular, right? So, if you look at that, then we will see that uh, Pintar Mas stands for Primary Immunodeficiency Network for Advocacy and Research Malaysia. So, Mas, um, so let, let me see. Now, have I gotten control? You know, the technology nowadays, right? Uh, the, let me just uh, see whether I can uh, move the slides around. But anyway, um, the P Pintar Mas, we gathered um, in May 2017. So that was more than four years ago, right? So we discussed as usual, as we do, we brainstorm everything. And by July 2017, we then met with the rest of the MyPopi, right? Or the, we had a, a, a meeting with the MyPopi members. And then and from there, we went on to create and we came up with the first draft of the paper. And from there, um, we had this uh, executive uh, uh, summary, if you can see. I think it will be, um, uh, let me see now. Uh, okay. All right. And so that executive uh, summary, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about it. Let me finish off this roadmap, okay? You can see the long and winding road, but we got there. But we hope for more. We're not stopping here, right? This roadmap doesn't stop abruptly here, right? So it's not where it's supposed to be, right? It's, the screen is only that big. The screen has to be bigger. We got to get a bigger picture to ensure that the government uh, hears, hear everybody out, right? And so um, we had the executive summary, and then in October 2017, we completed the white paper. So from there, we said that let's now meet the Ministry of Health, right? So we had gone to Putrajaya, okay? And then we, uh, actually we wrote up, right? Masai, uh, Pintar Mas wrote, to the Minister of uh, Health at that time, uh, Datuk Subramaniam. And he said, okay, have a meeting. And then we met the KSU, right? The Ketua Setiausaha or the Secretary General. And uh, that's us, right? Uh, all happy, smiling away because we have taken the first step of now handing over officially the white paper to the Minister via the Secretary General. Okay, so that was back in December 2017. 
Now, the Secretary General decided then, look, this is a technical bid, technical uh, paper that you have presented. I will need the Director General now. Right? To have a look at it. And he, uh, so we had a meeting and that was back in January 2018. And with the Director uh, General of Health, he's still the Director General of Health, right? Three years on, that was in January 2018. And uh, we discussed further on the request of the, um, what um, we call the call to action. So we highlighted a few things in the um, white paper. So now the white paper actually highlights four big areas. That big area would be your diagnosis. We have talked about the diagnosis quite a bit now. The treatment, Dr. Adley gave a fantastic account of that. All right, and then the care and the awareness. So these are the big four headings, broad headings that we wanted to highlight in the white paper for the policymakers to pay attention, right? So uh, Dr. Adli has already mentioned, right, on the severe combined immunodeficiency. And it is a pediatric emergency, right? If we catch them early enough, within three months, they can be cured. For goodness sake, they can be cured and they will be living into adulthood just like anybody else, right? Not in that bubble that uh, um, Dr. Adli mentioned from before. And the treatment, right? So the, the treatment is something that uh, we have to ensure. And we take it that the primary indications for immuno globally replacement therapy, the license indication actually includes for PI patients, right? There are many so-called off-label use of IRT at one point that there was shortage of IVIG, the immunoglobulin availability, because everybody else felt that they wanted to use that for other conditions. Now that's fair, right? I'm not against that. Don't get me wrong. But when you have a license indication for immunoglobulins, those indications, and it includes the primary antibody deficiencies, all the PI patients, you need to be ensuring that there's uninterrupted supply. Now, the care. We have been hammering this for a long time now. Now to recognize clinical immunology as a subspecialty, way before the advocacy paper came out. All right. Uh, um, certainly, if I were to uh, uh, mention the father of pediatric immunology, Professor Lokman, right, when he came back from Stanford back in 87, he had been advocating that since then. 87, 1987, we are 2021. And so we decided now enough, we have to have the advocacy paper. We presented that. We're still waiting for uh, a few of those things to be executed by the policymakers, by the Ministry of Health. So including to recognize clinical immunology as a subspecialty and to have more clinical immunologists for pediatrics. And believe it or not, there are no adult clinical immunologists in Malaysia's public hospitals, right? And this will affect the timely diagnosis and correct treatments of PI patients, uh, PI in adulthoods. So can we believe that? Well, you better believe it. And uh, awareness, right? So we have to collaborate with various NGO to promote more awareness on PI in the nation, right? And I come back to this uh, infographics. We are only capturing less than 2% of the patient that potentially should be diagnosed already by now. 2021, there should have been 27,500 diagnosed, and yet it's only less than 500. So our call to action, we tell, told uh, Ministry of Health, where we discussed uh, both with the Secretary General, with the Director General, to please recognize clinical immunology, either combined with infectious disease. Now that's happening, but we'd rather it be a standalone subspecialty because then it will also cater with, um, uh, for the adults as well, because currently it is combined with pediatric infectious diseases, 
So um, then I uh, already mentioned, uh, and Dr. Azli has uh, mentioned uh, about the um, newborn screening, and we would like that to be now part of the newborn screening for early diagnosis of skid. We will now also request, uh, uh, you know, respectfully that the immunoglobulin replacement therapy will always be prioritized and uninterrupted. And to diagnose uh, di um, more patients, now we need more facilities, obviously, for the uh, laboratory investigations and particularly in East Malaysia, because currently it's cent uh, centered around mainly uh, even Klang Valley or several uh, centers within uh, Peninsula Malaysia. And then lastly, the Ministry of Health to work with MyPOPI, to work with the Malaysian Primary Immunodeficiency, to work with Maasai, and to work with the newest group, right, recently. But we are all not uh, a new group in that sense. We are a new group entity, but everybody inside there are all very seasoned veterans, scientists, immunologists, clinical immunologists. And this group is the translational immunology group for education, research, and society. Put that all together, T-I-G-R-S, Tigers. So we would like to, we would love the Ministry of Health, the government, to please work with all of us, all right? And make this a reality and offer all those patients with PI the rights that they are due for a very long time now. So. It's been a long journey, Karen, and with you together, and also Bruce and everybody else, the family, the, the members of my copy, the patients and their families. It's been a hard uh, journey, but at least uh, recently, uh, Tigers, uh, we uh, made our public statement on how we also can help with the pandemic. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed uh, to know all of you, all the patients who have given all of us here the motivation to keep on uh, uh, fighting for your rights uh, to have optimal care for your conditions. Karen. Thank you, Dr. Amir. I couldn't agree more that these challenges are something that no one organization or entity can address alone. We all have to work collectively and collaboratively. So Dr. Amir, you highlighted earlier you know, in a white paper and thanks you know, for sharing all the call to actions that we hope you know, that the Ministry of Health or you know, the different stakeholders can come together you know, to leave no PI patients behind. So you, you highlighted earlier that the white paper includes the challenges faced by PID patients in Malaysia. So on this note, we are very, very happy and you know that we will be able to show a short video clip of an adult PI on the challenges that he is facing. He has faced in the past and he's still facing today. So to all, to all our viewers, please increase your volume in order to listen to the video clearly. Yep, so let's you know, just uh, take a look at this video by Sarah Vernon, you know, one of our PID patients. My name is Sarah Vernon and I'm diagnosed with congenital hypogamma globulinemia. Since birth, I fell sick very often and was diagnosed of having immune disorder at the age of 16. As an adult patient, I face some challenges. Uh, first, I'm being treated by various specialists from respiratory, infectious disease and hematology instead of an immunologist. Secondly, I was given IVIG treatment on an experimental basis from the beginning. Sometimes I was prescribed uh, from 30 bottles to even three. My treatment was stopped due to a recession in 1998 and was only resumed back in 2005. During this period of no treatment, I had pneumonia attack which have damaged my other vital organs. When my treatment resumed, I was prescribed IVIG every six weeks instead of recommended treatment, which is every three to four weeks. When this was highlighted to the doctors, uh, they refused to consider shortening my treatment intervals uh, unless I get serious infections that require hospitalization more than twice a year. Recently, I had another pneumonia attack, which further damaged my lung. I tried talking to my doctors again to shorten my treatment interval, but was refused. I had to write to the HOD with the international treatment recommendation for my condition. Only then it was considered and 
the hospital agreed to shorten my IVIG treatment to four weekly. My case would have been handled better if I was seen by an immunologist for adult PID who can better understand my condition and provide me with optimal treatment. I would have had a reduced infection rate and uh, my vital organs could have been saved from further damage. I could have had a better quality of life. Thank you. A big, big thanks, you know, to Saravanan for sharing his uh, personal journey and struggle with PI. So coming back to you both, Dr. Adli and Dr. Amir, perhaps could you both um, share your views on the current challenges surrounding PIs in our country? Dr. Amir, shall we start with you first? Well, I'm just going to go to this, uh, uh, what I mentioned before, right, about there's no adult clinical immunologists, right? There's no adult clinical immunologists in the government sector. Zero, none. So, I mean, the government must take uh, urgent steps to address this issue. Adult patients uh, with PI, especially those uh, presenting with PI in adulthood and yet not diagnosed as physician are not likely to diagnose PI because they're not thinking about PI. And of course, then the, these uh, patients are going to be deprived of any uh, optimal care. And then, of course, for those who are diagnosed in childhood, they, they will grow into adolescence and finally adults, right? And there are no clinical immunologists to manage them. So adult PI patient must, must be managed by clinical immunologists, period. <laughs> okay. So please, the MOH must not sideline these basic rights of adult PI patients any longer as we have highlighted this for nearly 15 years and even before the advocacy paper was officially created. So uh, I think that would be uh, one of the major challenges and all those things that we highlighted in the advocacy white paper. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Amir. Dr. Adli, your thoughts? Okay, um, Karen, thank you so much. I think it's a very well um, described the challenges that uh, we are facing uh, by Dr. Amir. In children among the pediatrics, um, we are seeing a better light, to tell me. I think, um, you know, because of the PID awareness program. So the PID awareness among the community of practice among children had definitely improved. So that is a good news. Nonetheless, although awareness is generally had improved, we still have some complex cases still misdiagnosed and appear later. And because of, um, because of that, this, you know, this PID go unnoticed. So I believe it is an important move now to think about advocating and implementing this PID newborn screening for each of every one of the newborn baby delivered in Malaysia. Another thing I'd like to emphasize is the access to the immunoglobulin replacement therapy among children. Yes, we don't want the case of Saravanan again, you know, um, you know no uh, un sorry, interrupted supply. So that's definitely not really a case in children. It definitely improved and supported well by the Ministry of Health because they are clinical immunologists among the pedi pediatrician. So now our children with PID, eh, our children, our pediatric patient with PID is growing older, bigger, they are smarter and more active. And of course, all patients, all any little human being, you know, patient with PID have the right to live normal and healthy lifestyle. So I guess the current challenge uh, for us, for the, for the physician, for the pediatrician to treat this patient is to provide flexibility in this pediatric patient, the young adults, the adolescent, for them to choose their treatment option. In Malaysia now, the immunoglobulin replacement therapy only come in one option, the intravenous immunoglobulin. So that these need to be given in the hospital and require patient to be absent from school and work. We have now, uh, Karen, the subcutaneous option, which provide freedom and flexibility. And this also be something that we should offer for our now healthy and more active adolescent and young adult patient. And with regards to the stem cell transplantation, as I mentioned, we are very lucky since the last 15 years, this has now become a standard treatment for patients with skid who are diagnosed early. But the expert, the centers, and the budget to perform to other PID diseases are still very limited. So we really hope this will be another important challenge to be addressed by the stakeholders of Malaysia health system. Yeah. Um, and yes, Dr. Ami emphasizes zero clinical immunologists in adults. Yes, our number among pediatricians, we are improving. 
from initially two, Dr. Amir and then Prof. Lokman, you know, the pioneer in 1987. Our numbers now is six, seven, clinical images among pediatrician. It had grew since the last 10 years. I'm at the latest addition to it. But the numbers are still very low, very uh, low to accommodate to the whole community of Malaysia and very much centered to the, you know, uh, West Malaysia. So more training support, exposure to the will will be something that need to be instilled in our medical communities. This can be done through the assistance, through the partnership with all the partners that Dr. Ami had mentioned. You know, my poppy, you know, Karen, you have the patient advocacy group. And then we have the Pinta Mas, which Dr. Ami have explained, you know, come with a white advocacy. These are the experts in the PID. And now we have the tigers, the Malayan tigers, you know, the translational immunology group for research, education, and society. TIGERS, that is a very nice acronym that Dr. Ami himself actually come up with the idea. I think it's a group collective thing, but it's very much Malaysian, very nice flavor, and we can do this. Definitely, the, the landscape of our primary immunodeficiency disease in Malaysia is now have a spotlight, but yet the spotlight is not bright enough. We want it to be brighter. We, not, we want it to be, you know, more for our patients. And it is for our patients. It is for us, the community. Right. Thank you, Dr. Amir. Thank you, Dr. Adli, for the insightful sharing, you know, so far. Right. So we will now move to the uh, Q&A, you know, uh, from our audience. And um, so, we, you know, I'll just read, um, you know, the questions that we have received so far. All right. So is cirrhosis an example of PI? And what are the treatment options available, including alternative remedies? Can it be cured? Yeah. And we have also you know, another question on you know, the same uh, question on cirrhosis. Um, they are rooted to the immune system. However, how can medical professionals help patients better by dissecting possibilities of PAI rather than treat the surface issue? I usually have questions that I trigger you know, to the physicians or specialists to dig deeper but not many patients know what to do or, you know, what to ask, you know, their doctor, you know, when they are, um, you know, seeking medical cons uh, uh, consultation for cirrhosis. So I think for this question, you know, um, Dr. Amir, you are the expert and a specialist to, you know, address this question. Over to you, Dr. Amir. Yeah, so cirrhosis basically is an autoimmune disease, right? So um, rather than a, a PI. So it's an autoimmune disease where the immune system now uh, attacks itself. So there is a very, it's a skin condition, obviously, and it attacks various cells. So uh, within the skin, and it's an autoimmune. So the strategy then now would be, in the simplest form, um, would be to use topical steroids, right? And um, so I think um, if you have that condition, and if you suspect that, you would see a uh, dermatologist, and they are the main uh, people. Uh, who will be treating. Now, in the case of um, more recent uh, treatment with uh, autoimmune conditions, uh, there'll be biologics or monoclonal antibodies. So these monoclonal antibodies, um, particularly uh, patients that may have also what we call arthritis, so psoriatic arthritis. So these are the group of patients I do treat uh, with the monoclonal antibodies, right? So. Um, there are many modalities, but essentially, because it's an autoimmune condition, we need to suppress the immune system. So that's in the uh, a nutshell uh, about the um, psoriasis and also the, the treatment. So please go um, uh, talk to your dermatologist, see your dermatologist and get the best treatment from there. Right. So speaking of autoimmune Thank disease, you. yeah. Dr. Amir, speaking of autoimmune disease, um, Dr. Amir, there is uh, also a question on autoimmune. Is it the same as PI? No, it will not be the same. Now, if you look at the, um, the, the whole immune system, right? So we look at when there's an immune deficiency, there, there's a defect, right? So the deficiency. Now, when the immune system now goes the other way around and becomes hypersensitive, in a way, that's what autoimmune is. Your immune system has become hypersensitive, but hypersensitive to your own cells, your own tissues, your own organs. So that's an autoimmune condition. Now, in PI, you can also get autoimmune conditions presenting itself. And people think that, that is, that's it. I have an autoimmune condition. But actually, there are 
uh, certain conditions of PI. Um, I mentioned the common variable immunodeficiency before, and they might have, let's say, someone had been diagnosed with, um, say, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. That means the platelet now is low because the immune system is attacking it and the numbers are low. So ordinarily said, ah, it's just an, uh, a low um, platelet because the autoimmune condition. Now, in CVID, the common variable immunodeficiency, that can also be a presentation. So there can be also hemolytic anemia. So there are many other things. And hence, if you think that someone has arthritis, uh, I suppose I'm uh, saying this to the rheumatologist, and it doesn't quite respond. And now you take more detailed history. They've been having you know, a couple of ear infections in the last uh, six months or so. Now you start thinking now, could this be a primary immunodeficiency? So that's what I'm saying. Always think PI if you want to diagnose PI. So there are two separate things, but PI can also manifest, not just with the recurrent infection, not the, with the serious, persistent, unusual recurrent infections, but also with uh, autoimmune conditions as well. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Amir. So I think uh, we have another question here. Um, PI autosomal dominant or recessive, I think, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Amir, Dr. Adli, you know, uh, PI diseases, it's a mouthful, <laughs> okay? And uh, autosomal dominant or recessive, and yeah. which are the common subtypes? You know, does one subtype runs in the family? Uh, Dr. Adli, would you like to take this question? Yes, um, I think we highly want to emphasize that primary immunodeficiency, as the word primary mean, uh, usually we try, uh, we think about hereditary and it's a genetic effect. And you are right, the two common terms that usually come, you know, not, yeah, two of the terms that we usually come when it comes to genetic disease is autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. This is referring to how the disease can be inherited, you know. Um, I'm not going to go in detail about AD or AR, but answering that question, yes, in primary immunodeficiency, both subtype can happen. In fact, the x link as well is another common type. Um, that usually happens. So there are multiple types. It can also be sporadic. But talking about autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, answering that question directly, both can happen. Both is a way that it can be inherited and you know it can be inherited. Autosomal dominant, not as much as autosomal recessive subtype. There are a few, but yes, both can run. And again, because this is hereditary disease, they are genetic disease it can run in the family and one of the i think one of the uh one of the key point i one of the key signs of that time or sorry one of the warning signs in that 10 warning sign is presence of positive family history of patient who died early or honey have infection or even with pid because this again as we emphasize genetic disease and it can be inherited so yes it can be either autosomal dominant, it can be autosomal recessive, it can be exing, or it can even be, you know, sporadic, which can happen spontaneously without any family history. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Adli. So uh, we'll take one last question. I think um, this, I will direct it to Dr. Ame since he was touching on adult, you know, PI. So the question goes, why adult, you know, can, you know, have PI, you know, during adulthood? Uh, is it because of, um, you know, mixture of uh, vaccine inoculation or I guess probably, you know, some somewhat like gene mutation, you know. So, Dr. Amir, over to you. Yes, simple answer is more of a genetic mutations, nothing to do with the vaccines, okay, right? And um, so, if anything, the uh, vaccines might, ha might have been um, highlighted, the problems of potentially having a PI because if let's say you had a BCG and it had a very bad reaction um, or, and then infected, then you start thinking, is this PI? And so it is a genetic condition. Uh, Dr. Adli has already mentioned that. Um, so we talk about hereditary is genetic, genetic mutations. And um, you know that um, uh, quite a few of the adult ones, right? Uh, are still not quite known uh, the genetic um, uh, mutation per se. Um, for example, that common variable immunodeficiency. Now, if you take that condition, uh, we are probably uh, once upon a time, certainly when I was training, uh, we always say that it's more of, uh, you know, uh, what we call um, uh, only about less than 5%. There was a gene defect that was identified. 
and now it has started to increase. But because it is still very much starting with a clinical diagnosis, a clinical suspicion, a high suspicion of index of PI. And then that's where we go on to uh, diagnose that. Because, uh, okay, we had the advantage of uh, advances in the molecular uh, genetics since about 1993. So more and more genes were identified from around that time because of the technology. But um, just imagine, before that, we didn't have the genetics, right? We didn't know the gene defects. We had those children with severe combined immunodeficiency. We're still going to transplant them. We're not going to wait and say, hey, uh, where's, the, where's the proof that this is a genetic uh, mutation going on, right? It's a clinical diagnosis first. And at that time, uh, there was no need for that, or rather there wasn't any uh, luxury. Now we can better define things, so that's why uh, we go on to do the newborn screening because the technology is better. So yes, adulthood uh, presentation, it probably had been a genetic mutation. Uh, some presenting a little bit earlier, maybe even the adolescent going on 20, 30 years old. And even uh, later, I mean, um, I've had a, certainly when I was in uh, training in UK. Um, so I think uh, it was uh, 60 year old. <laughs> Uh, even uh, and then, then there was a condition because uh, the lady had uh, what we call a thymoma at, at that point. Now, in an old lady with thymoma, that's not, you know that's something strange because that organ, uh, which is part of the immune system to educate the uh, white blood cells that Dr. Adli mentioned before, uh, would have regressed. And, and because if that was detected, and then you have to start thinking, hey, is this a primary deficiency? And yes. She uh, had that removed. She had a, a antibody deficiency. She went on to uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So, yep, yep. it's all a genetic mutation. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Amir. So, um, you know, we are coming almost to, a, you know, to the uh, to a close of our webinar. So, after hearing and learning so much from both of you this morning, Dr. Amir and Dr. Adli, I believe one question remains in many viewers' minds this morning: What should I do if I suspect my child? My family member, or even I, might have PID, you know, or PI. Um, Dr. Adli, let's hear from you first. Okay. Yes. Very important question. I think this is a important thing that we want the audience to take back. And my advice, the main advice, is to seek medical advice early from your trusted and friendly doctors. We are not scary. Come and meet us. You know, any of the doctors. As Dr. Ami and Heike mentioned, uh, to diagnose PI is to think of PI. So if you have that suspicion of PID, um, and if your doctors actually think that it might be, this can be further referred to the immunologist or the specialist center trained um, and familiar with the immunological diseases. And in Malaysia, we are very lucky. Now we have a numbers of well-established centers that specifically train for PID diseases. Um, on the government side, um, I'm going to mention this. We have uh, my center in UKM uh, based in the Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kumukris and the uh, Hospital Pakar Kanak Kanak, the special student hospital that's soon to be open, hopefully after we got back the hospital because now it's a COVID hospital. We have another center in Hospital Pengajar UPM under the leadership of Associate Professor Dr. Intan Hakima. Up north um, in Kedah near Penang, we have ITPT um, of University of Science Malaysia under the lead of Dr. Intan Hakima. And in HKL, in Hospital Kuala Lumpur, we have in Hospital Tuanku Aziza, the Children and Women Hospital, we have another center with several immunologists looking after the patients. That includes the, you know, the honorary professor, uh, Dr. Lokman uh, Mamano, Dr. Sangita and Dr. Marina, uh, the, you know, the coming uh, immunologist, and myself um, there as the visiting consultants. So additionally, I think, uh, Karen, they are all main tertiary hospital in Malaysia will be adequately prepared to be your first point of contact to seek advice and treatment. And if the initial screening suggests PID, your treating doctors can directly refer to any of us for further consultation. All of these centers are part of the network known as Pintamas, you know, uh, Dr. Amir had mentioned this, which is a network of expertise. We share resources between, you know, the nation, between the region, and even actually we have international centers to support us. So this is what we have integrated in our main healthcare system by the government and the universities. So this is where you should get your advice, um, you know, if you are looking at the government section, government sector. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adli. Dr. Amir, what about patients from the private hospitals? Okay. 
I would just like to uh, echo everything that uh, Adri has mentioned, right? So, because I think uh, we, we have to talk about the government public hospitals, right? And of course, the teaching hospitals, uh, first and foremost, right? I think, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Adli has been pointed uh, the, the few number of centers, the few um, clinical immunologists around. I, I'd like to add, um, I mean, that if you people be asking, so how many clinical immunologists do we need anyway in Malaysia, since we're all grumbling here? <laughs> And uh, the WHO, right? This is WHO, the World Health Organization, had a long time ago, back in 1993, came up with their uh, paper, uh, their WHO bulletin. And they stated very clearly, okay, that you need one or two clinical immunologists per million population. All right? So if that being the case, let's do the simple maths now. We have about 30, 33 million. So we should be having about 60 clinical immunologists. And if there are about six clinical immunologists, we need to make 10 times. That 10 times bigger, right? And you take Australia, 10 times, yep, yep, yep. And you take Australia, who has about the, more or less the same population like uh, Malaysia, they have more than 60 clinical immunologists, right? And of course, it's not just clinical immunologists uh, with the uh, uh, primary immunodeficiency, um, and it's also now called uh, inborn error of immunity huh? of late, right? So it's an inborn error of immunity. And um, so we, we um, say that let's uh, ensure that we have those numbers, right? So not just IEI, but autoimmune diseases, although more are probably taken care by the rheumatologists, right? And of course, there's the allergy, right? The clinical immunology has these three big groups. So a clinical immunologist will be able to treat primary immunodeficiencies, autoimmune conditions, and allergy conditions. So we need at least around 60. So there we go. So we, we, we are not just making noise here. This is the recommendation of the WH, uh, the, the, the World Health Organization, right? And that's been way back, more than 20 odd years ago. So we, we can do it. And um, yes, as Dr. Adli mentioned as well, um, we do have the two trainees now. Uh, they are both pediatricians under the pediatric infectious disease and immunology, right? One of the few things that has already been attended to by the Ministry of Health from the uh, uh, white paper. Uh, we thank them for them. Uh, we thank them very much. Yeah? And to continue uh, having more trainees in future to make up that 60, all right? And uh, in, in private hospitals, well, um, it's the same thing, right? Um, well, there's only the Allergy Immunology Center <laughs> in Panta Hospital, but that's of course my uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ken Wu, uh, in Glen Eagles. And um, between the two of us, we are kind of managing <laughs> mm. the um, private sector. <laughs> I mean, that's not ideal at all. Yeah. Okay, so we need everybody's cooperation on this one, every single people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, as you can see from the chat, you know, uh, Dr. Amir, Dr. Adli, I think everyone, you know, all our audience, you know, are very appreciative of this morning's, you know, insightful sharing. Thank you very much for your time. And before we conclude our webinar today, please allow me to summarize the take home message from our session this morning. So people with primary immunodeficiencies or PI are more prone to infections and health problems that lead to serious and debilitating illnesses or even death. Therefore, early diagnosis and therapy of PI are essential to improve patients' chance of survival and improve their quality of life. As you can see from the beautiful photos that we have here, you know, PI patients can live a happy life and fulfill their dreams or aspiration when they receive proper management and optimal treatment for their conditions. When a child or adult has severe persistent, unusual, and or recurring infections of the 10 warning signs, they should think PI. So once again, a big thanks to you, Dr. Amir and Dr. Adli, for your sharing today. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. We hope um, you find this webinar helpful and useful. And you can find more information about PI or contact us on my Poppy website and Facebook. Thank you once again, and please stay safe, everyone.
Back to you, Victor. Thank you to our two expert panelists, Dr. Adli and Dr. Amir, as well as our moderator, Karen. I'm sure our audience has a better understanding of primary immune deficiencies now. Before we end, please do help us complete the evaluation poll, which will appear on your screen now. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to our co-organizer, my Poppy, and um, the uh, Pediatric Immunology Unit from the Faculty of Medicine in UKM. A big thanks to our sponsors, the International Patient Organization for Primary Immune Deficiency, IPOPI, Malaysian uh, Society of Allergy and Immunology, MySci, and MyPOPI for supporting and making this webinar possible. So thank you everyone. Uh, have a great weekend and do stay safe.